The September 14, 2018 Governance and Policy Committee will now come to order. The first item on our agenda this morning is the 2018-2019 Committee Work Plan. If uh, yesterday is any indication, we'll probably pick up a couple minutes here. So um, we'll turn that over to Executive Director and Corporate Secretary Brian Steves. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, in your docket you have a, a work plan that's been outlined. Uh, this was developed with committee leadership. In addition to the items on today's agenda, you'll see uh, several themes running throughout it. Uh, one is the update to the board's bylaws, and that will, that will be returning to the committee later. Uh, there's also a, a conversation arc related to ethics and responsibilities of the Board of Regents. This is prompted by the comprehensive review of the board's code of ethics, and, uh, and then will be broadened to include a discussion around the board's policy on responsibilities of the board and individual regents. Um, in addition to that, there are several other policy items as well as some placeholders for uh, best practices conversations related to governance uh, in, in, uh, in future months. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the work plan, but uh, that's just a quick overview. Any discussion? Mr. Vice Chair, do you have any commentary? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I Pleased to have been working with the chair and Mr. Steves closely on this. I think there are uh, many timely and important topics to put to the committee, and I, look, I really heartily endorse the work plan. Thank you. Further comments? Questions? Uh, and I would just add to that that you obviously, as the year goes, matters may come up uh, uh, you know, that would be properly before the committee, and I will turn to Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Rosha. I've uh, <clears throat> been watching and paying attention from a, a small distance as the various work plans come together. I, uh, have, I believe this is thoughtful, well put together, and reflective of uh, the governance needs and the open questions that we face. So I appreciate both yours, um, board office, and Vice Chair Beeson's time and effort, along with the administration. Thank you. Thank you. And also thank you to Sarah Dirksen, Jason Langworthy, for, for the work that they put in, in addition to Director Steves. We'll move on to the second item, potential amendments to the bylaws of the Board of Regents. This is for review. I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Langworthy. Thank you, Chair Rocha. Members of the committee, good morning. Before you, for your review, are proposed amendments to the bylaws of the Board of Regents. The bylaws were adopted on December 10th, 1889, and they've been amended 18 times since, most recently in July of 2001. There are three main categories that the amendments fall into. Uh, the first are reflective of committee feedback from the June 2018 meeting. The second are areas previously identified by regents. And the third are, are from the results of a comprehensive review by the Office of the Board of Regents in consultation with senior leaders and the Office of the General Counsel. So uh, if you look in your docket, we're going to go to page seven and I will just walk you through uh, the, the red line language uh, that is before you. So on page seven, you can see uh, first in, in article two, uh, we're simply removing uh, the footnote and referring directly to the university charter. On page eight, uh, we're updating uh, number four secretary to reflect that uh, the secretary shall preserve the records of the board, not simply the books and papers. Uh, in section D, uh, election, this is the first instance, and you'll see this throughout, where we are updating uh, the notification requirement and removing the requirement that notifications be sent by United States mail or facsimile, and instead changing that to electronic communication. So you'll see that noted here in section D, election of officers. And then if we turn to page nine, uh, under section E, vacancy of an office, again, notification shall be sent by electronic communication. Same with meeting notices then under section A, annual meeting, and section B, regular meetings. Uh, the other item to note in section uh, A, uh, annual meeting, is that uh, we're simply reflecting current practice uh, that the chair uh, makes committee appointments following the annual meeting. Uh, it has not been our practice to make those at the, the annual meeting. Moving down to uh, Section C, Special Meetings, uh, we added Special Meetings of the Board of Regents or of its committees. Um, we took out that language uh, in the next article, Article 5, just to, to clean that up. And then uh, we added <clears throat> two items uh, reflective of committee conversation from June. So first, we clarified that a special meeting must be 
called by the chair at the written request of any five members. We wanted to make sure that that was clear that it would uh, need to be in writing. And then on the next page, on page 10 at the top of the page, that a special meeting must be held within 30 calendar days of the chair receiving the written request. So that right now there's no time limit. Uh, the chair can receive a request for a special meeting, uh, but could wait and call that meeting uh, many months from, from when they receive that notice. So this would require that the chair calls the special meeting, that the special meeting actually be held within 30 days of receiving the written notice. Under section five committees, uh, we have done a couple of things here. First, uh, our practice has been that the board itself name and identify the responsibilities of standing committees through Board of Regents policy, board operations, and agenda guidelines. So we're simply reflecting that practice. That's the practice that we followed when we just recently updated the committee charges. Then uh, we eliminated uh, the two numbers, uh, uh, one and two, uh, consolidated that language, um, made sure that we were clear that the chair appoints both the committee chair and the vice chair. Uh, that they can then uh, fill any vacancies or make any uh, changes uh, as needed. And you can see where we took out the special meeting language there since that was replicated in the previous article. Turning next to section D under article six, voting the question. Uh, this is where we're removing the requirement that the board uh, vote to allow a regent to participate by phone. We've also added the possibility that they could participate video, uh, via video conference. Um, certainly we have the technology with, within this room uh, and we think that's something that uh, could be beneficial as we continue to explore that with uh, the Office of Information Technology. Under section E, uh, we aligned it to the current practice of how the docket comes into the Office of the Board of Regents. Uh, the green sections, we did not update the language, we simply reversed the order uh, for readability. And then finally, uh, uh, we just noted that recommendations of the board committees by default always come to the board except uh, as provided in board policy. Uh, litigation review, for example, has dele uh, is delegated authority um, under board policy, so we just wanted to make sure that that was uh, clear that that uh, does happen uh, from time to time. Uh, moving on to uh, page 12, uh, in section G, uh, we just cleaned up the minutes to reflect again current practice that uh, we don't transmit the minutes, uh, we make them accessible to the public and to members of the university community on our website. And we're making very clear that the secretary shall ensure that the minutes, the docket materials, any video recordings, and video recordings include a full transcript that is used as the closed caption, and you'll hear that about that more a little bit later this morning, are preserved uh, by university archives. So you're directing the secretary to ensure that they're preserved and that they're preserved in a, uh, a multiple redundancy situation. Under section H, uh, we simply added video conferencing there. Uh, and then moving down to the bottom of page 12, uh, we added the direct um, uh, Board of Regents policy code of ethics uh, citation um, and eliminated uh, that other language. Uh, on page 13, section C, uh, this is a question that came up a couple of years ago by then uh, Regent Laura Broad. She asked what would happen if a quorum of the board were unable to serve, either because uh, of a uh, tragic accident or uh, let's say a, a debilitating uh, pandemic. And in looking and thinking about that, uh, we we uh, realized that um, we agreed with Regent Broad that there was a gap in policy in the bylaws. So what we've done is we've carved out a very specific narrow provision that if there is a time when the quorum of the board uh, is less and the governor or the legislature, depending on, on what time of year it is, uh, have yet to make an appointment, that the board could convene, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and take uh, necessary uh, action to ensure the continuity of the university, and only if it becomes necessary. Um, and you can see that we've tried to very narrowly define uh, what that is, and that the remaining regions would only uh, be able to continue to act to, to ensure the continuity until a quorum of the board is, is restored. And then finally, in uh, uh, the last um, change there in Article 9, uh, again, we've just changed that from United States mail to electronic communication. So I would be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Langworthy. That was a very thorough process, and I think there's a lot of stuff here, and we'd open the floor to questions or comments. Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Langworthy. 
Looking on page uh, nine, uh, special meetings. Um, a written request by five members of the board to call a special meeting. I'm thinking about the math of that. Let's say that those five regions signed a letter to Regent McMillan to call a special meeting, and under this he'd have 30 days in which to call it. But doing the math, there's seven of us that don't want the meeting for whatever the agenda item is or purpose of the meeting. So the meeting could be called and um, uh, Regent McMillan say, uh, entertaining the motion, I'd say, I move to adjourn, boom, we're done. That why wouldn't you have a majority of the board asking for a special meeting? At least that's the math of it. Because now you have the minority have, you know, speaking, but the majority still could have, have the vote for whatever the purpose. It may be a volatile issue, a controversial issue, a mundane issue, but it could be uh, we'd gather and one motion and be over. Before I turn to Mr. Langworthy, uh, Regent Beeson, did you want to respond to this? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Point? Chair. I, um, I w my answer would be that it's a way to protect a a minority, but it needs to be a strong minority, not just one or two people. So I, I do support the, the, having that threshold of, of, of five people. Um, and so they have their opportunity to be heard. It doesn't mean they control the vote, but they have their opportunity to have a matter um, or matters brought to their attention, to the board's attention. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Rebuttal. Mr. Regent Johnson. Mr. Chairman, I fully understand that and, and appreciate it. But let's say it's a very controversial, volatile issue that the board has very strong opinions about on both sides. Such as forming an LLC. Forming an LLC. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, Chair McMillan calls the meeting to order and he recognizes me and I say I move for adjournment, which is a higher motion. And we vote and there's seven vote to adjourn and five say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, did, I didn't get hurt. I'm just looking at the math of this and I know it's very important that the minority or at least five members of the board could ask for a, a meeting because I think under the <clears throat> old way of doing things, the chair had complete control of calling a meeting. And this is giving the membership the opportunity at least to say we, we want to have a meeting. I'm just looking at the worst case scenario of controversy and how it might work. That's all I'm asking. Thank you, Regent. Just a clarification. I th this has been in place since at least 2001. So this is not, I don't think this is a change. So um, to that extent, the, one is, is, is five in the minority presumes a full board because you could have a circumstance where three members are um, not uh, serving, in which case then five you know, gets you to a meeting. But um, I'll, I'll go to, I, Regent Abdul was in uh, on this topic. I'm sorry. Did, did you want to speak on this topic? No, different topic. A different topic. Uh, Regent McMillan, are you want to speak on this topic? Yeah, thank you, Chair Rosha. I uh, was just going to confirm what you had just said. The five-member ability to call a meeting, I think, has been there a long time. What the change is, is to require the chair to call it in 30 days. It was, you could ask for the meeting, and then the chair had to call it, but there was no time reference around it. Is that is that correct, Mr. Steves? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Regent Johnson. Well, I don't know that I have any more commentary. I think Rick's or Regent Beeson's raised an important point about preserving minority voices and Regent Johnson's raising uh, the practical realities of whether that actually happens or not. So, well, but the key is all we're doing here is putting a 30-day window around the chair's ability and to schedule timing. Regent Johnson. Well, Mr. Chairman, I uh, understand that uh, under this new language, proposed language, you would have to, as chair, call the meeting but the meeting could be very short, is all I'm suggesting. Uh, General Counsel Peterson. Thank you, Chair Rocha. Um, I just thought I'd provide a little policy context for this. Um, Regent Johnson, I think your point is well taken that procedurally it may lead to a public meeting that's very short, but I think the notion sort of akin to what Regent Beeson is alluding to is that a strong minority here ha will have the right to force the board in a public fashion to disclose that there's 
an issue that five members believe should be on the public record, so to speak. And if it's the case that the majority of the board then wants to, um, by appropriate um, procedural motion, adjourn the meeting early, so be it. But at least um, that will be then reflected um, in a sort of public forum, so to speak, that would um, reveal that there is a controversial issue. So it's actually um, in cases of controversy that this would perhaps be the, the most important reason to uh, have this type of a relief valve, if you will, for, as Regent Beeson says, a strong majority, or excuse me, strong minority. Thank you. And Mr. Langworthy. Yeah, uh, Chair Rocha, Regent Johnson, you had mentioned this in June, and, and we did think about uh, are, is there, are there any structures that you can put in place, right, to say that the, the, the motion to adjourn is, is not in order until five minutes within the meeting or until the point has been addressed? And, and that just created a lot of, of gray area that I, I don't think you would want in the bylaws. So I, I would agree with General Counsel Peterson that it at least ensures that the board as a public board has to take up the topic even if the adjournment immediately happened. And then at that point, certainly the five members could continue to request that meeting uh, if if they so chose. Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Chair Rocha. Um, I can think of um, at least one time in the past uh, several years where there may have been a need to call a special meeting where the chair did not want a meeting to occur. And that's probably when we looked at this and said, hey, this isn't very clear on how this is supposed to work. And um, I think that 30 days is probably too long because there's a good chance that a regular meeting would occur um, also within 30 days, depending on what month you're in. And so if uh, I would say maybe 15 days, 21 days, or you know something less than 30 days would be more appropriate for something like this. Thank you, Regent Shu. I um, would certainly understand the sort of impracticality of a 30-day limit back when the board met every second Friday and preceding Thursday. We now have gaps where we will have a 60-day period. Um, and, you know, there would be the opportunity for us to have that conversation. Um, you know, whether we do it here, we're on review at this point, uh, but it's something that we could certainly uh, talk about is whether a shorter time period makes sense, whether it's 21 days, 15 days, or if we remain at the proposed 30 days. Um, I think that certainly the intent, uh, as Mr. Langworthy described, is prior to this proposed change, there's no limitation. And, and it, so to some extent you could make this, um, and, and this goes to, I think, Regent Johnson's point, that uh, um, you know, that if the chair is not in agreement with the five, you could essentially uh, fill, you know, stonewall the, the prospect of a meeting. And so, you know, obviously we would hope that this isn't the case, but not anticipating the future issues and personalities and so on, it's, it's hard to know. So that, that may be something we can talk about um, uh, as, we get as we prepare to bring this back for action. Uh, I would call on Regent Omari on this point. Thank you, Chair Rocha. Uh, so in my years, I don't recall a time where we were in need of a special meeting, but um, it, it, it raises the, the question then that was going to be my comment that I was waiting for, which is Section C that I know I heard Mr. Langworthy say catastrophic times, hurricanes, epidemics, um, but it's not spelled out in here. So if there's a time where five members think we need an emergency meeting and then five other members can't attend the meeting, are we in a place where that's a, an emergency meeting and now there's, I can't do the math, five to seven people who are here and then board operations continue? So I'll... Let me form that into a question. Does that make sense? I, I understand what you're saying, and, and I, I think there's a fundamental question under that, which is the fact that, and this was actually one of the questions that I have, and, and you know, obviously the fifth and sixth and seventh time you see it, you know, you come up with new questions. But, you know, for instance, would being in Scotland make you incapacitated to serve as a regent? Versus, yes. you know, how, how do we define, Mr. Langworthy, if you can provide some guidance on that, and maybe General Counsel Peterson could. Uh, also illuminate the issue, but how, how do we know? Are you asking a different question? Well, it, it's, it's well in line with that, but even just simply schedules, right? If we're determining that we need an emergency meeting, right, then board operations in emergencies would say that if people can't attend, 
right? What if I just can't be here or what have you? Then we have a meeting with five people say they won't be able to make it within a 30 day span or 14 day span or what have you. Does that mean that we can then operate with three regions? Mr. Or five, the five regions that wanted the emergency meeting. Mr. Langworthy, Region Omari is on a soul searching trip for 31 days in the Siberian tundra. What happens, how, how does that impact the, the call for an emergency meeting versus the un incapable to serve? Uh, Chair Rocha, Regional Mari, that would be an absence. And I would point you to uh, the times when the vice chair can serve. Uh, the bylaws say in the absence of the chair. So in the absence of members, uh, right, members not being able to be here uh, physically or being able to, uh, you know, come in via telephone or, or video conference, that would be an absence. This is unable to serve so that you cannot discharge the, the duties of the office either because of incapacitation or death, uh, not because uh, you are uh, remote uh, from, from the meeting. Um, so, so that would be uh, the situation. Um, and then the only thing that could be done would be to ensure the continuity of the university. So it's also very clearly spelled out that even if you got into a situation where maybe uh, uh, you know, uh, five regions felt that they, they could do this, they could only act within the bylaws to ensure the continuity of the university. So only making emergency appropriations, naming an acting chair, designating an acting president, authorizing emergency funding, and other actions necessary to ensure the continuity. So it's also uh, very uh, narrow in what uh, this group could do, uh, and it's really only if necessary, if the continuity of the university is in danger. Right. Thank you. And Regent Anderson? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, in listening to Regent Omari's question, I also, when I read this Section C, I'm fine with it, but I really think there needs to be a definition of unable to serve somewhere in there, uh, which gets to that question. I think it needs to be Lengthen so when it says unable to serve as defined by that should be in there also. It's not just an absence. Thank you. Mr. Langworthy, you're nodding. Is this something we can perhaps work on a draft of some proposed language to give clarity to what that means? Because you certainly can yep. understand how in a charged environment people may seek to in, in, you know, interpret that language um, in an advantageous way that may be inconsistent with what we are intending at this point. And with good minutes, we'll know what we intended at this point. But that's a little foreshadowing. <laughs> yes, we will, Chair Rocha. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments with respect to this? I would note that the language does provide um, to Regent Anderson and Regent Omari that chairs of the standing committee serve at the pleasure of the chair who may replace them at any time. I was uh, brought to my attention as I was reviewing this. So stay just, on your just the standing community committees stay on your, <laughs> stay on your best behavior well you're just the only people i can single out right now <laughs> anyway. uh, all right thank you any any uh, regent beeson did you have a closing comment okay well the, again this is for review um good robust conversation and we will uh, take these um, these points that have been raised in regent johnson i appreciate you bringing that up i think that at a minimum is a nice opportunity for us just to talk about the interests of, of you know, members of the board and being able to bring matters forward with a substantial minority and so on. So I appreciate that you, uh, that you brought that up and, and uh, were able to help illuminate that as well. So we'll move to item number three. We are right on time. Roll and function of board minutes. We'll turn this over to Maggie Flatten and Jason Langworthy. I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, I will, Chair Rocha. Uh, members of the committee, our next uh, item are the uh, focuses on the role and function of board minutes. And I know that this can be a uh, what might uh, seem to be a dry topic or, or maybe even a boring topic. Uh, but the minutes uh, become the historic record. Uh, for example, at this point in the minutes for this meeting, it will indicate that the committee and the audience gave the presenters a standing ovation. <laughs> and, and that's why it's, it's important that, that we focus on on what is contained uh, in the minutes uh, and the other pieces that you just heard about in the bylaws that partner together the docket materials, the video recording with the transcript that become the broad historic record for the board. Uh, certainly we get questions on what did the board do here or when uh, certainly uh, some of you have asked questions of what has been the evolution of this policy we look first to the minutes and then often we'll work with university archives to pull out the docket materials and other items to create the, the history of the, of the board and certainly the broader university. 
Uh, as we just talked about, so I'll go uh, very briefly through this slide. This is the current language in the bylaws, uh, but that the secretary is charged with keeping them. Uh, the lengthy reports are referred to, but kept on file, uh, which would be the docket materials, uh, and certainly reflect the votes cast in committee. Um, the other section uh, in the bylaws uh, earlier uh, in the same article uh, requires that we also record the votes of the regions. When thinking about what the purpose of minutes is, is broadly and, and maybe the, the type of minutes uh, that we should be uh, thinking about using, we looked at Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, the bylaws um, uh, make Robert's Rules our official parliamentary guide. And uh, Robert's Rules of Order recommends that minutes should contain mainly a record of what was done at the meeting, uh, not what was said. And it differentiates between minutes and a publication of a assembly's proceedings that would include a transcript. So that was, uh, we felt like, helpful context in just looking at what our parliamentary uh, guide uh, had to say. So now I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Board Associate Flatten, to uh, talk about the types of minutes. Thank you, Chair Rosha and members of the committee. There are three primary types of minutes. Um, this first one is summary minutes, and that's what that's your current practice for the committees um, and the board. And some, uh, summary minutes um, summarize the discussion and also paraphrase any comments uh, that are made at the committee. And it really gives a um, the reader a sense of how the discussion went during during the meeting. So, on this slide, you'll see um, this should look familiar. This is a, a section of the minutes from the May twenty seventh. Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting. So this is um, a minutes that you've approved and, um, under our current practice. All right. The next type then is um, verbatim or transcript minutes, and this is exactly um, a transcript of the meeting. It includes everything that's spoken. Um, and on the next slide, there's an example here from that same set of minutes from the Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting, and you can see the length here. Um, it captures all everything that was said, um, according to speaker. And I just want to um, go back and say that the summary minutes for the Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting that we're using examples for here um, were seven pages long. Uh, this transcript version in its entirety would have been 44 pages long, so it's quite lengthy compared to the current practice. And then the third type um, are action minutes, and uh, these minutes record who presented, what items were heard, and the outcome, but no additional detail about the conversation um, that the committee had in leading up to any decisions that were made. And so here again, that um, example from the Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting, this is what that same section uh, would look like. And in total, um, these would be about two to four pages um, of minutes compared to the seven. So in looking at um, moving forward, um, we took a survey of our Big Ten peer institutions, and you can see that the majority of them, or about half, um, are using summary minutes. Uh, one of our peer institutions, Ohio State, is using verbatim minutes, and then there's a handful that are using action minutes. One thing I just want to point out here is that um, our colleagues who are our peer institutions that are using summary minutes don't have um, video or um, audio recording or live streaming of their of their meetings. And so their minutes, they're using summary minutes to capture um, a more fulsome record of the meeting, um, where you can see action minutes. Uh, the, our peer institutions who are using action minutes have other records of the meetings, as do we. So on this next slide, um, this shows um, in total the maroon bars are the number of YouTube views for all of the committee meetings um, and board meetings. And the gold bars show the number of times that the minutes for those same meetings were accessed. So if we're looking at how the public is interacting um, with, with you to get this information on how you came to decisions or how you um, had discussions in your committee meetings, they're going to the YouTube video more so than going to the actual written minutes for the meeting to get that record. Sure, Rosha. Uh, the evolution of our board minutes, uh, we have copies back to 1889 <clears throat> that are held in the university archives. We also have uh, uh, bound volumes of minutes uh, here in the board office. And from 1889 to 1972, I would characterize our minutes as being action minutes that included personnel changes, resolutions, and board policies. So uh, a broad amount of, of information, but really just stating what the board did, not giving you that additional uh, sort of summary minutes that we have today. From 1972 to the present, uh, we've evolved into using summary minutes that have captured more of the discussion. And I'll note that 
uh, from 1972 to 2000, uh, the summary minutes were the only uh, publicly available record. And then in 2000, with, with the construction of, of this room, uh, we started to uh, live stream the meetings. And currently, our, our YouTube uh, channel has uh, videos uh, dating back all the way to, to 2010. Um, and certainly, last fall, we started streaming and archiving all of the omnibus committees. Uh, just this fall, audit and compliance also uh, met in the board meeting. And each of, of those videos also contains a full transcript. So we have a transcript created uh, in order to provide a closed captioning file that is more accurate than what YouTube would simply generate. Uh, and that is contained within the video. So someone can look at the video and they can also look at the transcript at the same time, in addition to our minutes and docket materials that are still available on our website. <clears throat> Uh, so in our uh, in in the board office's um, mind, there are three options: uh, status quo, continue with summary minutes, transition to a verbatim or transcript minutes, or transition to action minutes. And our recommendation would be to transition to action minutes. Um, right now, summary minutes are inherently subjective. They're probably the least optimal of the three options that we're using. <clears throat> it requires us to paraphrase your words. And when we have a video that the public can watch and that we can preserve and we can make sure is protected within the university archives through a redundant backup system, uh, that feels like a better way to access that information. And the action minutes allow us to leverage uh, that technology. We can certainly put in there uh, links directly to uh, uh, you know, minute marks within the videos, links to the docket materials, and have a more wholesome, uh, more fulsome, excuse me, uh, uh, a historic record uh, that can uh, ensure that uh, the board is uh, uh, well represented uh, when uh, future boards uh, and future uh, board staff look to do research uh, in the minutes. So we would be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you both. Um, Regional Mari. Thank you, uh, Chair Rocha. Uh, thank you for the, the, the update and for the examples and kind of laying out exactly what uh, is happening here uh, with other institutions. From my standpoint, uh, looking at the fact that we uh, document via video as well as audio, um, and, and I don't know exact. I imagine that those stay available forever, the video, yes? Mm -hmm. um, and so since that's the case, I mean, I don't see a reason why we should continue doing summary uh, minutes, not only for carpal tunnel purposes, but also <laughs> for uh, just time of, of the staff, um, especially when we can reference folks to the video, which is probably better than summary minutes anyways. Um, so as I think about this and thinking about moving forward, as long as we know that we can keep those videos archived and, and be able to have them accessible, I say we move to uh, action minutes um, that are more bullet pointed than, than anything else. Region Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I do agree with Regent Omari. The, uh, before we started to talk about this uh, uh, with the chair and staff, I, I wasn't familiar with the archival sort of option or redundancy. Um, but I mean, these, these have to be maintained forever. This is, and we, it, there has to be a backup system because it's kept just at the office. Somebody makes a decision to delete after so many years or uh, hits the wrong button. It's just totally unacceptable to lose this permanent record. So uh, I think for us to uh, go this direction of the action minutes, we you have to be able to demonstrate through a procedure to us uh, with input from the archives office how this is going to be preserved. Uh, uh, and and I think it's both audio and video. We're, we're mm -hmm. talking then. Okay, and committees, committee work, full board work. Okay, thank you. Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Chair Rocha. <clears throat> um, I disagree with uh, my colleagues on this because we know that Google loses information. We know that there are, you know, bad actors hacking into our data or trying to hack into our data all the time. We had an audit committee uh, briefing yesterday that talked about all of the um, other universities, not ours, other universities who've um, lost information or have had information stolen. Uh, so I would stay with either the, uh, uh, the status quo or transition to
to the verbatim or transcript minutes. I know that's more work, but the problem that I have here is, uh, and having done research on certain uh, certain histories of our policies, for example, the reservation delegation of authority, you know, I was able to go back through our files and uh, electronic uh, files and look for certain um, search for certain words within the files to find uh, when uh, certain things were discussed in prior meetings. You can't do that on YouTube. And the other thing you can't do on YouTube is I can't say, hey, look at this. Start at one minute, five seconds, and listen to or watch until five minutes, 20 seconds. And then, you know, someone would have to transcribe that if I wanted to bring a record to a meeting. So I think. Um, for, for us to do our work, uh, we need to have uh, better records, and uh, they, they need to be uh, both in electronic format and a paper copy should be kept somewhere. And uh, the other thing I would say is, in the example, if you could go to the example of um, our current minutes that you showed. The, oh, no, yeah, right there. So in this one, I, I like how this one was done in, in, uh, in the fourth paragraph. It says, Regent Hsu inquired how the long-term financial implications of faculty tenure are considered in the process. That at least gives the question. But in other cases, it just says, in an answer to Regent Hsu's question, and then doesn't say the question, gives an answer. And so it's hard to understand what the person was actually trying to say or what the question uh, related <coughs> to the answer was. So I like this version um, of, of, the, of the minutes, and I think that's what we should continue doing. But I would say that the transcripts would be even better uh, because there have been, there's at least one case where I was accused of saying something, asking a question in a certain way that someone didn't like or was offended by, and by going to the minutes as they were kept in this format, it didn't actually have my question in there. So then we had to go to YouTube and transcribe the question, which took a lot, a lot longer. Yeah, just in response to that, I, the, I'm, I'm a little bit confused, Regent Shu, because you're saying that you, you like the, the, the version that's in front of us, but the version in front of us does the very thing that you're concerned about. It says here, in response to questions from Regents Powell and Anderson, but it doesn't say what the questions are. And that goes to the point that Mr. Langworthy was making. Before the technology uh, available now, um, summary minutes were better than action minutes because it gave some context, albeit heavily subjective. And as you know, I have brought, I brought changes before the, the board, you know, as I've read minutes and thought that it was confusing as to how something that I would have, uh, have asked um, was presented. Um, and, and I will turn it over to Mr. Langworthy before I, I turn to yeah, other, I other uh, I'm not done yet, Mr. Regis Chu. Um, but the, uh, I don't think what you're saying is necessarily inconsistent with what Regent Beeson is saying, and I also don't think that it's inconsistent with what Mr. Langworthy is saying, because I believe a transcript is still going to be produced. And then the question is, uh, and, and Regent Beeson makes a great point in saying, we're not just going to rush into this and say we're going to put this out on an unsecured server, that there has to be a way of whether there's a server that's not accessible outside of that individual server that will act as an archive so it can't be hacked unless somebody were to plug into it. I, my, what I'm getting at is I, I think that your, the concerns you're raising are contemplated in the process. One is the transcript is made, and secondly, any technological um, maintenance is going to have to be rock solid before, you know, we're not just going to leave it out someplace where somebody can go in and delete all of our history. Um, I will let you respond to that, Regent Shu, and then I'm going to turn to Mr. Langworthy to, to determine whether I'm, you know, uh, on track here. Go ahead, Regent Shu. Oh, okay, thank you, um, Chair Rosha. So in response to the first um, uh, thing that you said where I was inconsistent, well, I was only looking at what I said. I, I do see that in paragraph three that it just doesn't say the question. But I'm, what, what I'm trying to say is that if we do it in the way that paragraph four is done, then I would be happy with, okay. with it, okay, not just the general. So the other thing is, is there's no such thing as foolproof technology. You could have a server sitting in the back room here that no one has access to and then there's a failure for some reason, and then six months later, someone goes back and says, oh, holy cow, we, we don't have any records for the last six months. We hope that the other version somewhere is good. But what I'm saying is it's just, there's no such thing as foolproof, other than making sure that we have paper copies and, and other, thing, other ways of backing up that are not technology related. So 
So. And, and I would just point out, Regent Shu, that I went to Steinersdorf, Germany, to find the records of the Rosha royal lineage, apparently, and the church had burned down. And so even the, the paper documents aren't necessarily uh, foolproof paper, either, right? Copies. Fair enough. All right, I will turn to Mr. Langworthy, and then I've got a couple of folks on the, on the uh, west side of the table that would like to speak. Mr. Langworthy. And, and Chair Rosha, just to clarify, so uh, currently YouTube does have the, the capability to link directly to a moment within the meeting. So we would anticipate having action minutes where you would have the agenda title, you would be able to go immediately to that, that video. We've also started conversations with the Office of Information Technology, well, you know, with University Archives, <laughs> to ensure that, that these things are, are maintained, even if YouTube were to be eliminated, because certainly we have to plan for that, that likelihood. And in the amendments to the bylaws, uh, that new language directs the Secretary to ensure that the minutes, the document materials, and the video with transcript would be preserved. The other thing I'll note is that the action minutes, they would be keyword searchable. They would be very quick to be able to maneuver through and uh, as compared to say a 45 page transcript. So you could at least very quickly find out the board took action on this then. Now I'm gonna go over to the video and I'm actually gonna watch that portion of the meeting. And then if I want to, I can literally pull out the transcript and, and have a record in, in that sense. Um, so I think this uh, controls for the subjectivity and it really leverages the technology in an exciting way. Thank you, Regent Omari. Thank you, uh, Chair Rocha. I'll, I'll just, this is not what I am advocating in favor of, but if we go the direction where we're doing verbatim uh, minutes or maybe even as robust as we're doing now, I suggest we put a budget aside and hire someone to transcribe the, the minutes. Thank you, Regional Murray. Mr. Langworthy, uh, my understanding is there are technologies available that get us a very close version that don't take near the, the, the personnel investment. Uh, am, I, am I correct in saying that? Uh, Chair Rosha and Regional Mari, um, we currently utilize a service um, to transcribe the minutes from the YouTube video. So that provides the verbatim transcript for us. Thank Regent you. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. That was actually my question. In this day and age, I, I understand we have the transcripts. We must be doing them and they must be available for at least for the board members for voice recognition to say who said it and put it on there. And for speakers at the table, it could also be transcribed electronically and their names could be put in. So that is done now with virtually no personnel costs to the office, correct? Chair Roche and Regent Anderson, that's correct. We um, pay for a service to do that for us. So, so, so with that said, my, my recommendation is, is somewhat to go to action minutes. We can see the action that took on. We're going to have the archive video. And we're going to have paper transcripts available to us of everything, of verbatim. So I, I think technology today is going to drive this for us. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. And, and that actually is a nice um, reminder when I look at the, uh, the, the proposed changes to the bylaws. It really is you know, a, a major part of that is just uh, the fact that technology has changed. They changed to add facsimile. Well, that's you know been, been around a while. And, and so I think this is a, that's overdue, and I think that this opportunity in leveraging that technology with considerations for securing um, archival records, um, yeah, I think we're in a, in a pretty good place. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Rocha. Um, I support the action approach, too. I'm, I, I understand Regent uh, Shue's concerns, but knowing where I go, we, that's how I support it. My, my comment is this. In a leadership role, you get a first-hand opportunity to see the extraordinary commitments that our board office team makes, and uh, they are taxed. They are heavily taxed, and as we think about ways to uh, lighten that taxing load, uh, I think that's important. So I appreciate the commentary from the other side there about uh, about workload and resources, and uh, we don't want to add much more to their plate. Maybe this will actually help them uh, work on higher priority items, so thank you. Thank you, Regent McMillan, Regent Anderson. Just a, a uh, thank you, Chair, just a quick follow up on that. I think, you know, in answer to Regent Shu and want to be able to search for this, if we made the transcribed minutes done electronically available, he's able to search for whatever he wants. So I, I think we can solve all the problems. I think, I think we can solve all of them. Thank you. Thank you, and, and, and then on Regent McMillan's point, the, the summary minutes actually take more of a human input than the transcribed minutes with the action minutes, right? So I think that there, to, to that point, Regional Mari, I think that we may actually have a gain and that you raise a great point. 
Further conversation, further questions, comments? Mr. Chairman. Um, I will go to Regent Johnson and then Regent Hsu, and then we'll let Mr. Steves close unless somebody else has a pressing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is by way of uh, compliments to our uh, board staff, and uh, Regent McMillan alluded to it. Um, having worked in a number of organizations and not wanting to make comparisons, but I think we have the best staff now in the Regent's office that, uh, that I've seen. And we see it uh, with youthful thinking about technology and anything we can do to uh, relieve some of the, if you will, mundane chores so they can think more strategically with us about the future. I think we should uh, endeavor to do that. But publicly to you, Mr. Steves and your staff, uh, you folks are good. And uh, now we can talk about it in the back room, but I think we ought to say it publicly and we thank you for for your service to this university and as you integrate with a greater university community and with senior leadership, um, thank you. Thank you, Regent Johnson. And, and in addition to the standing ovation, <laughs> <laughs> if there had been more than just the two of us, we would have carried you around the room in celebration. <laughs> Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Rosha. I would uh, echo Regent Johnson's comments. And I would say that um, I'm actually surprised that we have verbatim transcripts because I've never been told that we have them and I've never seen one. So um, yeah. I'm actually surprised. It's a great day for Regent Shu. Yeah. <laughs> day of discovery. Further comments or questions? <laughs> All right, hearing none, I will turn to Regent Steves for uh, Regent Lang, uh, Mr. Langworthy. <laughs> I'm sorry for the demotion. <laughs> uh, if you have another comment, otherwise we'll turn to Director Steves, uh, Ms. Platten. Director Steves, bring us home. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. And Regent Shu, we had actually told all the 11 other regents. <laughs> oh, man. Um, it's amazing we were able to keep the secret, Mr. Chair. That's why we have public meetings. <laughs> Uh, members of the committee, we're, we are very excited to bring this forward and we appreciate the, the, the warm comments about staff. Uh, we do have a great team. I mean, the, 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 the folks sitting in front of you are, are a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, duo that, that perform a lot of work on behalf of this, uh, behalf of this board. Um, what I would say is this really gives us an opportunity to be uh, innovative in, in a way that we don't see our peers doing. Uh, we're already innovative in a lot of ways, and this allows us to, um, to take that to a different level, uh, to leverage technology in a way that we don't right now, to, uh, to demonstrate how to uh, make the board more uh, accessible to the public. And so we're excited about it. We think that um, we, think that, that we could possibly even pilot this for this next, uh, this next set of board meetings, so that the minutes that are prepared for this meeting and, uh, and this set of meetings, we could actually pilot in this action minutes format to demonstrate to you and show you how it would work. You'd see the action minutes, you'd be able to link through to videos um, at certain minute markers and, um, and see what you think of it. And so we could come back to this same conversation next time with you having seen uh, what those minutes would look like uh, in that format. And in terms of redundancy, we are very sensitive to the, the the topic of redundancy uh, right now, um, and, and we are consulting with the Office of Information Technology, but right now the, um, the video archives are, are redundant in at least three ways. We have them on YouTube's servers, we have them locally stored on servers um, with, within the board office, and we also have university archives um, grabbing those videos and storing them on their, on, on their servers. And so we'll explore that more and make sure that those, that those redundancies are in place. Uh, and we certainly also could ensure that uh, paper copies of the of the transcripts are are maintained uh, in the board office too. So we think we think it, it does meet the best of all worlds, and and we're excited to bring this forward. Thank you, Mr. Steves. And when I kind of think about how the three uh, omnibus committees um, operate, you know, you've got the finance and operations. To use the carpentry analogy, is you know how we're going to use the saw. Mission fulfillment is are we using the saw the right way and this committee is you know, sharpening the saw. So giving us that ability to look at uh, these operations and I really appreciate um, uh, the board leadership setting things up in a way that gives us this opportunity and then board staff obviously 
I, I can't say more than has already been said about how um, remarkable this is. And, and, I, and I agree with Mr. Steves. I think that when you look across the, our peer institutions, um, I think we are very well suited among the, the very best for, for being forward thinking. No further comments or questions on that topic. We will move to our fourth agenda item, board input into the region selection process. I will turn to Director Steves yet again. And Mr. Langworthy, I believe you will be with us as well. So Director Steves, you want to bring us in or turn it over to mm -hmm. Mr. Langworthy? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, we're excited to bring this, uh, this topic before the committee because uh, we think this is, uh, again, a, another opportunity for, uh, for the board to be very transparent in the way that it, uh, the way it operates. Uh, the Regent Candidate Advisory Council, as you know, is created by the Minnesota Legislature. There's a statutory um, reference to it that, that creates the, the council. And it also charges that council with something that maybe, uh, maybe you're not familiar with, and that's, that's what's on the screen right now, and that is that it is to develop in consultation with current for and former regents and the administration of the, of the University of Minnesota uh, its statement of selection criteria and the description of responsibilities that it will use as it seeks to recruit candidates for the Board of Regents. Uh, this has been done in the past in, in, in various ways. Uh, it, it's, but it's been primarily informal. Uh, it's, it's consulted with, um, it's consulted with the, the board chair and vice chair uh, or a, a second term regent not seeking re-election. Uh, there have been members, uh, individual members of the Regent Candidate Advisory Council that have uh, made inquiries of the board office about certain policies or, uh, or you know, how the board functions or the, the, the number of hours that regents tend to spend on things. So it's been just a very informal process. Uh, and the, the board, has, board, uh, board office has provided that kind of information, and certainly regents have, been, uh, have individually uh, been invited to the, the Regent Candidate Advisory Council to provide that kind of input. Uh, Regent Johnson most recently uh, visited with them in September of 2016, and Regent Cohen in September of 2014 uh, did that, and others in the past have done that as well. Uh, what, what this topic today is intended to do is to provide uh, a walkthrough of the selection criteria from the last cycle and give this committee an opportunity to, to weigh in and offer comments and feedback. And then what, what we have is we have everyone's input. Uh, that can be provided to uh, the Regent Candidate Advisory Council both in an action minutes and video format. No. <laughs> both in a both in some bullet points as well as, uh, as, well as video. They'll be able to see and, and, uh, and hear what exactly your comments were. And so we think that that's a way that, this, that, the, that everyone is able to be engaged in providing that kind of feedback rather than just one or two members of the board. So uh, uh, Jason Langworthy is going to walk through those criteria and then, uh, and then we invite your comments and questions and, and uh, remarks. Chair Rocha, members of the committee, as Executive Director Steves mentioned, uh, these are the 2016 uh, RCAC selection criteria. Uh, they're largely the same as those developed in 2014 for the 2015 election cycle, uh, and it allows us uh, a good starting point. Uh, so I'll just quickly walk uh, through these. Uh, they're broken into to two categories. Uh, we'll start with the, the personal uh, criteria. Uh, so number one, a commitment uh, to the university and an understanding uh, its role in education, innovation in the state, the nation, and the world. Number two, uh, integrity along with a personal code of honor, and it makes mention of uh, board policy, a uh, code of ethics, uh, and the conflict of interest policy. Uh, number three, an ability to maintain a professional relationship with uh, university employees. Number four, the ability to negotiate uh, and build consensus. Number five, the ability to strategically analyze choices, uh, both for the short term and the long term. Number six, uh, an inquiring, inquiring mind and a willingness to listen and the ability to speak articulately. Uh, number seven, uh, the capacity to both challenge and support the administration. Number eight, uh, the capacity to analyze and evaluate the performance of the president. Number nine, the ability to function as a member uh, of a diverse group in an atmosphere of public transparency. Number 10, in appreciation for the public nature of the position of the university. Number 11, in ability to address the issues of diversity in geography, gender, race, occupation, international awareness, and operational needs of the board. 
Number 12, a willingness to embrace and utilize current technologies. And then turning to the professional, uh, professional experiential, number one, uh, knowledge and experience that relates to the needs of the board and the challenges and opportunities facing the university as a whole. Number two, uh, accomplishments and a history of success that reflect a breadth and diversity in life experience, and that would be beneficial to the priorities of the university. Uh, number three, uh, an experience in the governance and strategic oversight of large and complex organizations. Number four, an understanding of higher ed trends uh, both nationally and here in Minnesota. Number five, an understanding of the economic role of the university. And number six, an ability and willingness to devote the time necessary to serve as a regent. So uh, as Executive Director Steve said, uh, we certainly uh, look forward to uh, your uh, feedback on uh, at least uh, the 2016 as a starting point. Thank you, Mr. Langworthy. I'll turn to Regent Beeson for the opening uh, comment. Thank you. Questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, uh, placing this on the agenda. I think it is uh, it's the first time uh, in 10 years I think I've talked about uh, uh, this, and we are statutorily referenced in, uh, uh, on this topic. The, um, um, I think our role today is to talk about whether we think that the language that the RCAC has developed reflects uh, our values sort of individually and collectively uh, about, uh, about selection. My cursory review of the selection criteria is that it's good. I'm interested in hearing about what, uh, what uh, everyone else feels. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm glad Regent Powell, I think, is taking a turn to go visit. Uh, the RCAC members, some of us have done that in the past. Um, you know, this is not about sort of how, at the end of the day, RCAC uh, applies the criteria to candidates. That's really their business, and it's their business with the legislature who, who gets elected to that council. But I am really glad the chair uh, is elected to put this out there, and I think uh, looking at the criteria is, is, uh, is uh, is, uh, is helpful occasionally. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Omari. Thank you, Chair Rocha. Uh, generally speaking, in high level, I think these make sense. The, the one that I am going to pick on is professional and experiential under number three, experience in governance and strategic oversight of large, complex organizations. Um, obviously, governance is important because we're a governing body. Um, simultaneously, uh, essentially every student regent would not be electable according to number three. Um, and then without number three, a person like myself who say is not on the board now but decided wanted to run uh, this coming cycle, number three would not be applicable, <laughs> right? Well, governance would, I'm on several boards, but um, perhaps not the large complex piece of it. And so what I would encourage um, the selection body to be looking at um, is not just experience uh, in governance slash strategic oversight of large complex organizations, but the willingness to learn, the willingness to uh, engage, and the willingness to uh, really understand and take in knowledge about what governance is and what it looks like and how it should be um, applied. Uh, because otherwise we'll have a situation where um, every person coming uh, might look or uh, be of the same age demographic uh, and have a uh, very similar experience. But yet, I think we're not looking for the exact same people. Well, we shouldn't be looking for the exact same people with the exact same experience base uh, as we select members for the board. Thank you, Regent Omari. Um, and I will turn to Regent Cohen here in a moment. but. Um, You've identified a, a natural tension. Um, one legislator in the in the conversation about the process in, within the last couple of years indicated that you know, you know, her concern is that a pipe fitter would never be elected to the Board of Regents, and she found that to be um, a concern for her. And it is that tension between you know coming in with the, the understanding participate in the governance, but yet also recognizing that the board ref should be reflecting the people of the state and not everybody is a corporate board member in the, across the state. In fact, that's a very small percentage. And so what you may gain in that complex organizational governance experience 
you may <clears throat> lack in understanding the day-to-day -day challenges of a family that's trying to work its way out of a challenging situation. So I think you make a very good point. And in, in, um, while I, when I read number three, I say, sure, that would be advantageous. But at the same time, if it's considered to be a, um, a prerequisite for consideration, I think that it would, it would not be appropriate, at least to my mind. So thank you for, for those comments. Regent Cohen. Thank you, Chair Rosha, and, and I agree entirely, particularly in number three, what is a large complex organization? I mean, I think there's so many different definitions of that that, um, that I hope we take a very, that our CAC takes a very expansive look at that. Um, and is it, uh, to me, it's not even so much the experience in governance, but the recognition that there's a big difference between governance and management, and that uh, it's an understanding that those are very different roles and how one performs them. And as Regent <laughs> um, Omari said, uh, a willingness to, um, uh, to learn about the difference in those roles uh, between the governance and management. So, that's the understanding and willingness to learn about that is one of the things that I think is crucial. The other is um, some understanding of what an academic educational institution is all about. I mean, I, I think that often um, it's, it's, always, it's quite amazing to me that I believe I'm the only regent uh, on the board right now who's got a background in education. And here we are, an educational institution. And so my hope would be that, that regents who, people who become regents have some understanding, again, of what it means to be an academic and educational institution. So those two elements are very important, I think. Thank you, Regent Cohen. Regent Powell, and then we'll turn to Regent Peason. Uh, thank you, Chair Rocha. I have a, a question um, uh, for, um, uh, Mr. Langry, and then, a, and then a comment. And the question has to do just maybe a clarification on the, in the personal area where we talk about the ability to maintain uh, professional relationships with you know all the external stakeholders. What um, what what was the intent uh, of that? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I completely follow that one. I'm just wondering if you can maybe add a little clarification to what the intent of that um, criteria um, is. Chair Rocha, uh, Regent Powell, uh, unfortunately I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly what RCAC uh, had with within that. So I, I think it would be uh, 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 better for me not to, to speculate. Okay. okay. I don't know if anyone. Regent Powell, I think that's where you want the verbatim minutes as opposed to <laughs> the summary minutes from Mr. Langworthy. Follow up? Yeah. Yes. The follow up comment has to do. I, I also think that these are. are um, uh, a, a good set of criteria, both on the on the personal and the experiential, and I wholeheartedly um, support um, uh, Regent Cohen's thought on you know really a good, good understanding of the difference between um, governing uh, and, and 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 sort of running the institution. I'm wondering if you know in in parallel with these, I'm not sure if this is a workable idea, but in parallel with these. Um, we, we might help ourselves if we also, um, as a board, um, if, if there was some notion of what are the primary um, obligations of, of the board. And I think it's very common in, in the business world, as an example, um, in discussions of um, primary board roles, typically what you'll hear is um, a primary role of, of a corporate board is to ensure that um, leadership lives the values of the organization. And you know, just that the tone that's being set by leaders is is appropriate, and what we want—that's a key obligation of the board. And the second key obligation is the strategic oversight, and you know, being deeply engaged in that, and being satisfied that the organization has, um, you know, has clear strategy. And then the third one is just the quality of the of the of the, of the not only the president but the leadership team, and that you know that team is effectively implementing the strategy that's been endorsed. So, and I, I mean, I know that there are many statutory obligations that we as a board have that, that are written, um, but I, I, I wonder if we were to agree on um, the three or four, you know, blocks of work that are really critical to our success, that might also help, you know, kind of shape our thinking here. 
Thank you, Regent Powell. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do agree with Regent Amari uh, as it relates to particularly the student carve out for students as meeting criteria on large complex organizations. But I will say um, for myself, and I had a lot of governance experience, I've been in business for 40 years, uh, but I struggled sort of adapting to the scope and size of this university. And I look back at a couple of our former regents, Larson and Simmons, and I think they hit the ground running faster because day one they're used to huge enterprises and uh, they're, they're, I just think we need a many people, maybe not all, who have come from those large complex organizations. This is not a training ground job. It's not a first time board work. Uh, and I know, again, I know from my own experience, I don't think, I think I would have helped if I had worked for larger organizations. Um, and I look at those who have come to this board with a really different sort of uh, um, mindset that is more strategic, maybe, than what I did when I started. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Regent Omari, uh, responsive comment? Yeah, thank you, Chair Rocha. I, I actually, I, to underscore what I meant is the student seat actually protects against that. So I don't think there should be a carve out. I think that I'm saying with, without that, uh, that would be problematic. And, and I agree with you that having experience from large complex or is great. However, if the language suggests that we will only, or that will be a major component of how we select, then there will be a lot of people who will not be able to, to move through the process. So I agree that having some is, is absolutely a, a good idea. Um, so that that's what I, I want to make sure I clarify that piece there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Regent Mari. Regent Sfigum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, members, as I look at this criteria, it's, um, uh, for, first of all, it's mere words. We, are, we understand they're good words, they're good words, but they're mere words. It's actions that make a lot more uh, difference. Um, and I look at uh, number nine here, and the number nine I think is very close. Now it doesn't come up um, under personnel. Just a comment that I'd like to make, and I don't know if the words can be changed and or enhanced in any way, shape, or form, or even need to be, <clears throat> but all the boards that I've worked on and been part of and caucuses I've been part of, I've kind of approached them as a team. You're, you're kind of a team, and I think the 12 of us here need to be a team and have that kind of attitude for the uh, university. Um, and I would like uh, to recognize... Uh, uh, these words that we need the ability to uh, uh, to recognize and respect differences. There's got to be differences amongst us. There certainly is. But we need the ability to respect that, recognize it, and, and then after doing that, we need to work together as a team for the university's success. And I, I think that's crucial. Again, it's very mere words, but that's the actions that count is after we recognize the differences, we, we come together and we work together for the success of the university. And I don't know if it even needs to be wordsmithed and added, but uh, it's just a, a comment I have from, from uh, experience. Thank you, Regent Sviggum. And Mr. Langworthy, is that something that we can maybe work with Regent Sviggum if we've captured that in, in mm -hmm. with, with some proposed language? I, I don't know that we're gonna necessarily call for <coughs> motions to amend and seconds and so on, but we can, you know, kind of have this, this conversation to capture these comments and, and, you know, unless somebody wants to speak in opposition to that approach, in which case then we would have to find a way of resolving that, but I don't know that anybody would on the board, it's based on the body language that I'm seeing. If, if, uh, if I'm misreading that, please signal. Otherwise, we will move to, thank you, Regent Sigel, we'll move to Regent Anderson. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Langworthy, if you put the slide up about number one on professional experiential. So, so, so my story running for the Board of Regents is, um, you know, I'm kind of the accidental regent. I, I, I didn't know really about the Board of Regents until people in my community said, Tom, the way you, your history at the university and stuff, you should run for the Board of Regents. And I said, well, what's the Board of Regents? And they told me. And I looked it up, and, and as fate would have it, the, the region from my district was being 
offer term limits about a month, and the application was a month later. I delved into it. I sent in an application, and here I am. Um, but I will tell you that when I look at the professional experiential, and when I was in St. Paul trying to become a member of the Board of Regents, I saw two types of two types of people trying to become Board of Regents. Many were number one, number one on there. They loved the University of Minnesota, <clears throat> or they saw the University of Minnesota as an asset that was being wrongly operated. And so there, there were those that had number one. I think there are also, the other side was there were people that were numbers two and three. And I would say that's where I was. Uh, I had a diverse life experience. I'm a funeral director. I've worked with people all walks of life. Um, you know, other people will define if I've been successful at that or not, or if I know the subject matter. But I've been experienced in governance. I, I ran a large $35 million healthcare board, and I served on a regional board of Wells Fargo. So I understood governance. Um, and I think, I think my part of the governance part, there, there are people that say, wow, I've done this, I've been a mayor of a city, I've been a school board member, now I want to go to that next step. So there are a lot of people with those experience. And then you weigh that with the people who are number one, who just really want to be there because it's the University of Minnesota. Um, I think uh, FCC Chair Professor Constant had a really, really good analogy to what we need to do here is we hire professionals to drive our car. We have to build the lanes of the road that they navigate in, and we have to have some oversight in that. Um, I have a lot of empathy for the people that work here. I, uh, I worked as an entrepreneur, was always ended up being the CEO, things like that, and never had a board I had to answer with. It was data-driven, gut feelings, whatever. Uh, one of the boards I worked on, on a, on a healthcare board, we had an incredible CEO who had these visioning deals. And at the end of the day, he was right. But he got a lot of board feedback. Do we dare do that? Do we dare do that? But he had the right vision. But he had to get board approval. I sometimes look at, at the great staff we have here. We pay them a lot of money. They have, we had a discussion about it yesterday hiring staff. They're talented, they're paid for what they know. We have to watch that they're driving the car down the road. But we got to give them the latitude to use all two or three lanes. And I think there's a real issue with do we do that properly? The, 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 the oversight of what lane they're in compared to the um, narrowing and making them go in a certain lane. I, I think that is one of the, the biggest things we need to, and people that come to this board need to see, uh, or need to be willing to do. They need to be willing to do. We can <clears throat> clamp down when we have to clamp down, but let them have latitude when there's latitude to be given. And I think we'll have happier employees, and I think we'll have better visions of where we go. But I do see it as... My guess is in the next region cycle, there will be people that, A, number one, want to be associated with the university, and then there's also the, the two and threes. I think probably the big key is to find people that have all of that stuff. And I, I agree with Regional Mari that, or uh, Chair Rocha, the pipe fitter. I mean, my goodness, you, you made room for a funeral director up here. There, there's room for, for other people. So. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Further comments or questions? Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair Rocha. I would just add to that that um, the board's role um, is not necessarily what lane you're driving in, but where are we going? And we can't just get on any road and hope that we're going to get to a destination that's going to be built for the university. So I think what we need to make sure of, and obviously the uh, strategic oversight is, is a major factor here because we have to know where we're going. And I argued yesterday that because we don't have um, uh, an agreement, written document or whatever that tells us where we're supposed to be going, 
that we can have any decision pop up and it looks like a good decision that day, but or a good opportunity, but it's not necessarily good for the long-term interest of the university. And I think that's one thing the regions have to be looking for is the long-term interest. I don't think anyone else in the institution is actually tasked to look at the long-term institution. Presidents, you know, eight years for uh, President Kaler, uh, but we have to be looking out farther than that. And the president, the tenure of presidents is even shorter these days on average, you know, five to six years. And that's what they're going to be looking at. But somebody has to be looking longer term, and I think that's, that has to be accounted for in, in these criteria. Thank you, Regent Shute. Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, board members, for this uh, very good discussion. Uh, having sat on the other side uh, with, with uh, Representative Swigum, having to make decisions about uh, regents. It was a good experience, but uh, legislators struggle with this. Uh, I would tell you for a number, number of reasons who to select as a member of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. A couple things that I, I think are very important. All of us bring life experiences, great rich life experiences uh, to the board. When a new regent comes to the table, one of the things that I had to learn, I will admit, I had to learn to transition some of my thinking from the legislative body, military body, to the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. There's a different culture, there's a different language, uh, there's a different vision. And second of all, and I agree with Regent Shu, uh, if, if I were a member of the RCAC, and we have some of their members here today, not telling them what to do, but I want to know what is your vision for this university for the next five to 10 years. When you are completed with your term, what is the University of Minnesota gonna look like by, based on the governance policies that you are gonna be a part of? I think that's just extremely important. But that transition, and we all, we all have those, as I said, life experiences, that's great. But it's a bigger place than that. And uh, I agree with uh, Regent Swigum about <coughs> Uh, this team building, and that's so very, very important. That's not to say we can't uh, voice our opinions based on life experiences or our thoughts. That's, that's excellent. But uh, when the vote's taken, the vote's taken and, we, and we, we, move, we move forward. So that ability to transition into this larger complex uh, organization that's just unbelievably, uh, it's a world renowned. And uh, we are one twelfth of it as a region, as a region. So uh, this is good discussion, and uh, thank you for it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Johnson, Regent Powell. Um, just kind of reflecting on the discussion, I agree with um, Regent Johnson. It's it's a, it's a very good discussion, and perhaps what we're what we're doing here as a board is 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 circling in on a, on a few of the most important characteristics. I mean, both of these lists are, they're very good. They're very comprehensive. They cover a lot of ground. But what, I, what I'm hearing is if, if we, you know, take just as, a, as an example that our primary responsibility is to, is to steward the institution, you know, for successful outcomes on behalf of the people of Minnesota. You know, then our our primary. I think we'll, we'll we'll continue to end up saying that our primary work here is the vision of the institution, um, the strategic, you know, clarity with which we pursue that vision, and whether we feel we have the right team of leaders in place to to deliver on it. I mean, I think I think we'll continue to get back to a smaller list like that. It doesn't in any way meant to take away from all the other things here that I think are important, but it does sort of further define, you know, what it is that we're about here, maybe. Thank you, Regent Powell. In, in uh, consultation with the <coughs> Vice Chair, uh, Regent Beeson, we felt that this was a great opportunity, not just to assist with, I think, the, the RCAC process and the fact that there is the statutory uh, input process, uh, but also for a conversation with the board. And um, I think the, the, the comments made by Regent Anderson and Regent Shu um, illustrate, um, you know, one of the, again, the natural tensions, to use the term again, where you want to be supportive of the administration within the lanes that the board has, hopefully, with clarity, 
provided um, uh, for operation. Uh, but at the same time, and, and this is is something that that's not in the language as it as it currently exists, is you want people who are also willing to be constructively critical in their analysis of how things are being done. I think that's important. And what I think is interesting is whether someone thinks someone is is not being supportive enough, or whether someone thinks they're not being critically and critical in their analysis enough, tends to be based on whether they like where things are going. You know, if, if they're going the way you want, then anybody that's critical would be, of course, overly critical. And if things are not, then you think that we're not being responsible enough in our analysis. Uh, this is a really interesting conversation for me uh, because I was part of the very first RCAC process um, in 1989. It was actually started in 1988. And, and my observation is that um, the, the, the RCAC approach has changed, changed dramatically during that period. Um, when I look at the language, the selection criteria of, of 16, and I, and I like the input, I think that that's coming from the committee here, it's very broad and it's very subjective. And when you look at the candidates that you know, we know went through in the last two cycles, the 14 and 16 cycle, it's pretty difficult to look at any of those candidates and suggest that they wouldn't meet the criteria. It's just that they, they have different strengths, as Regent Anderson, I think, aptly pointed out, that some are really you know, we've got this kind of experience and some have this kind of experience. And Regent Beeson also made that point. Uh, but the, the process that RCAC uses, and, and I, uh, I think it's probably fairly well known that I have some concerns, and this is not the right forum, but the process has an election, there's an election system where people are excluded even though you would suggest that they certainly would be qualified. And when, and when the statute was passed and it was, and it was put in place by Senator Johnson and Representative Sviggum uh, many years ago, um, it, the ex expectation was a full range of candidates to let the legislature then decide. And at some point in there, it, the, the process has yielded a more narrow uh, focus. And so there's nothing we can really do about it. However, I do think that um, when they ask us for criteria, I've heard everything from people suggesting specific occupations should be identified as being necessary, all the way to um, things being sort of a wild west, anything goes, it's whoever has the relationships with the legislature being elected. I do take from this that we need more Regents Anderson and, and Cohen, uh, based on the background that they bring, but um, nonetheless, I, 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 I think this is helpful, um, Mr. Steves, if we're able to, I think, capture these thoughts and, and uh, at this point, I don't think there's anything formal that the committee would do. I think that we're passing this along to uh, Regent Powell in his in his efforts, and he will do with it what he will. Um, and uh, prior to turning it over to you for maybe a closing comment, I will turn to Regent Simonson and then Regent Peace. Yeah, being the newest member, thank you, uh, uh, Regent uh, Rocha. Um, being the newest member, I, I, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Regent Anderson on that point number one, the wording on that. I, I've been, I was given a memo by Director Steves when I come on board, and I've been reminded several times to be patient. And, and uh, uh, the language in there, I can say um, it's been a learning experience for me. And so the language is pretty, uh, to say you need to come in with that kind of knowledge, uh, I didn't have it. Two and three, like with Regent Anderson, yeah. But it's been a learning curve, so I, I think the, the language in there is uh, a little, I don't, I, I don't know if anybody could too, see, too restrictive, that. Too restrictive for what we would be looking for, Regent Simonson? Yeah, that's Maybe should be more reflective of the need to, yeah. Yeah. to rent ramp up. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thanks, Mr. Chair, for um, bringing this to a close. Um, now, we should always have one banker on the board. That, you know, <laughs> that's, that's an obvious. <laughs> no. Uh, I, was just, I was looking through the criteria, and um, I think that the RCAC should be looking for people who are willing and able to take leadership roles because we need, you know, regents. Uh, retire or they don't get reelected or, okay, you know, we've had re a regent pass away. But we need a pool of people who are willing to step up into the leadership role, and that's predictable through past board work. And I, I would, um, I would, I think that's something that they should look at going forward. Say that for the record. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Regent Beeson. 
further comments. I'll, I'll just two closing and then I'll turn it to Mr. Steves. Um, one is when I think about my life experience beside having served on the board itself um, as being applicable to what we do here, um, I think being part of the leadership of the Busy Buddies 4-H Club probably prepared me for this, this role as much as anything. Um, the, the, the second thing is, you know, were I a legislator, and I most certainly am not, and there are people with much more experience in that regard, I would want to have an opportunity to consider a full slate of candidates of varying backgrounds, but I'm mostly concerned with what their strategic vision is for the university. Because that, you know, as we know in our strategic planning process, that is such an important part of what, you know, it's, it's, it's the most fundamental thing that we do for the institution. So. I don't know that there's an ability to capture that specifically in here because there will be such a wide range. We can't say this is what that strategic vision should be, but it seems to me that the conversations there, you know, in my experience, having gone through the process several times, is that there are two different conversations, one with the Candidate Advisory Council, which gets into a lot of this sort of resume stuff, and then the other, when you get to the legislature, where do you think the university should go? And so I think the more that RCAC can provide a range of candidates for the legislature to consider in that regard, I think the, the, the better. Uh, Regent Anderson, did you very, have very briefly just on, on, on that comment? Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. I think that's somewhat the rub that the RCAC struggles with, uh, and and to no fault of theirs. And Regent Simonson mentioned it. It's like me knowing what the vision for the university should be is one thing when you're on the outside, and it's certainly another thing once you're given access to everything the university has on the inside. And it may change many people's viewpoints. Um, so I just think that's the rub. That's, a, that's the difficult point for the RCAC, is they want people with visions. But some people like me, I didn't know where the university should go I, I, until I got here. You know, that, I think that's a really, really difficult part of it. So that, that's my point on that. I don't disagree with you. It's nice to know where we want to go, but I think until you get here and know the how the university works and what possibilities we have, it's very difficult to, to show that vision. Thank you. Mr. Steves, close your comment. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I just want to thank you for engaging in this conversation. I think, uh, I think it demonstrates uh, the, the wisdom that, that uh, committee leadership had in bringing this forward and allowing all regions to weigh in on this and uh, provide that feedback. So it's very helpful. And I also just want to say, uh, it, it demonstrates also uh, your engagement throughout the day when we have we have bylaws, minutes, and selection criteria on the agenda, and uh, you guys bring this much energy to it. So thank you very much. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned. Thirty. Good. 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 That is. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm still not carrying anybody in the room on my shoulders, but. Well, Jason's ready for it. <laughs>